All right, what are we doing? That gets my goat. I thought we had retired that. Hi, everybody. This is Big Anklevich. Welcome to another episode of That Gets My Goat. I'm here with my podcast co-host. Hey there. Why don't you introduce yourself instead of me doing it for you? This is Rish Outfield, and I believe in animal reincarnation. All right. So I think it's pretty great that we're doing this episode. I mean, I, I, we're a little late. I realize the sequel is about to come out, but uh, Dog's Purpose uh, made quite an impression on me, and I figured it was high time we do an episode about it. Yeah. It's too bad that it's only dogs that reincarnate and nobody else. Well, yeah, I, I found it really uh, depressing when they hit that point home in the film. Uh, didn't, didn't the raccoon express knowledge that it couldn't know that it could only know if it was the same soul as the raccoon from the second incarnation of the dog (laughs) you know what's funny is uh one of the trailers when i went to watch the film we're actually reviewing today was for the sequel a dog's what was it a dog's journey Journey, i believe it was either a dog's journey a dog's survivor or a dog's Motley Crue. I could. I, the, it was an '80s band. Yeah, maybe it was Motley Crue. <laughs> ah, that's lovely. <laughs> yeah, I found that interesting. That, and I got a Christian movie, which I looked. I was texting you because there was no one else in the theater with me, so I was texting you during the trailers. Wait, wait, wait. And... Now, did somebody eventually show up, or was it you? Like me on prom night, was it you alone in the room? <laughs> Uh, it, somebody eventually showed up about, weirdly, they showed up like 10 to 15 minutes into the movie, they three dudes in. walked in. <laughs> and I just thought, wow, what, awful late. Okay. But yeah, it was just me. <laughs> when I bought my ticket, they had like the reserved seating and she's like, all of them are open. So which one do you want? <laughs> and I'm like, so like this one here, that's like colored. That's the only other person in the theater. And she goes, no, no, that's you. You need to pick one of these seats. And I said, there's nobody else. So, yeah, there wasn't a big crowd at my showing of Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. That's what it was called, right? I think we can just call it Into the Spider-Verse if you want. Or Spider-Verse. What do you want? What do you think? Okay. Can we call it Second Verse? Same as the first? Ooh, that's what they should call the sequel. So, yeah, I went to see that. I, I went to the last showing of the night on a Sunday night. So it was 10, 15 on Sunday night. So not not a big surprise that there wasn't a lot of folks there because it wasn't going to let out until after midnight on a school night. You know, kids would have to be at school the next morning. So I suppose that must be why. But zero people on opening... It was an opening weekend? It was. It was. So zero people in the theater except for me on opening weekend. That's just... Did the movie do poorly? It didn't. Huh. I mean, it, it it didn't do Avatar numbers. What? But uh, shut up. They, you know, they, it it did better than expected. Oh yeah, better than expected. Well, that's good then. <laughs> I don't know what to say there. Um, <laughs> we, okay, so we're doing this episode. Uh, we we'll be talking about the movie. Spoiler alert, of course. Did it take any arm twisting to get you to go to it? No, no, it did not if at we all. If we weren't doing this episode. Would you have still have gone to see it? Um, I may not have. I, I probably wouldn't have seen it on opening weekend, but I would definitely have seen it uh, in the end. Uh, I, I, If it weren't for this episode, I probably would have taken all the kids to it, which I may wind up doing anyways. Although more likely is they'll go without me to it because they all have weeks off at Christmas time and I have Jack off. Oh, oh. that was unfortunate. That's pretty good, actually. <laughs> I have nothing off on... You uh, work Christmas Day, don't you? I do, yeah. I have to work even Christmas Day. And I, I imagine going to work on Christmas Day will be a lot like seeing Into the Spider-Verse alone. <laughs> it will. There'll be about as many people there. It's like the fourth tier anchor right. who retired in 1986 is yep. there. And just it's comes like, out ah, once President a year. Reagan today said, uh, Trump, Trump. What? <laughs> I knew it was some kind of an actor. I just, I forgot. 
So, that, so yes, go way, way back when I asked you, would you have seen this anyway? You started to say something and I just steamrolled right over you as I do. Yeah, I, I, I totally wanted to see this. This uh, is my bag. Anything that includes spider ham in it. <laughs> I will be there for. Let me just give you a, a quick background of Spider Ham and me. Okay. When I was a kid in the 80s and Spider Ham, the comic book, first came out, that was the time that I had a friend that was into comic books. Now, I couldn't afford anything, not even comic books, which were, shoot, those were so cheap back in the 80s. It was what, like a buck? Probably for a comic book? About, in those days, it was 60 cents, man. It went up to 75 okay, so, toward the end of the 80s. So even less than a buck. And yet, somehow I still didn't have money to afford comic books. I think my, my problem was that I wanted to get like some kind of back issue that was going to be worth something. Like I wanted G.I. Joe number one, but G.I. Joe 50 was what was on the stand. So it wasn't happening. But anyway, Spider-Ham was coming out and I had a friend who... Uh, his parents bought him everything he ever wanted. And if they ever said no, then he, even though we were like in sixth grade, he would still like throw a crying tantrum fit until they gave in and bought him what he wanted. It was really embarrassing to be in the room when he would do that kind of stuff. And But it prepared you for podcasting with me. <laughs> there you go. But anyways, yeah, he had everything. Like, he had boxes. He probably had all the G.I. Joe comic books, including G.I. Joe number one and number two and all the ones that were valuable. But yeah, he bought all the Spider-Ham comic books. And then he started doing a comic book himself where it was supposed to be like Spider-Ham, uh, except for his was G.I. Mole where all the G.I. Joes were moles. And uh, then there was... Uh, this is a character that nobody knows, but there was this character from the 80s called Vigilante. And he came up with a new version of that, which was Vigilantler. And he was a deer mm. that was the Vigilante. And uh, th there was a guest appearance of Vigilantler in G.I. Mole. So, anyways, I knew uh, Spider-Ham from way back when. Uh, did you ever get Spider-Ham comic books when you were... I mean, you liked Spider-Man and you liked comic books. Did you dig on Spider-Ham? No, I, I never bought a single Spider-Ham comic. I, I was aware of it. I'd see it at the newsstand. I, I leafed through them a couple of times. But, I, I yeah, I didn't. I, I had to pay for comics myself. I mean... Very few people had their parents buy them comic books, but I couldn't <laughs> afford to buy everything that I wanted to. Um, right. and so usually, you know, I would go to the 7-Eleven and you'd look on the rack, the spinner rack, and I could get one. And maybe when I got a little older, I could buy two, but I never wanted Spider-Ham as much as I wanted, a, you know, the Spider-Man mm -hmm. comic book. But I was excited when Spider-Ham showed up in the, the second trailer. And yeah, that, that helped cement my desire to see the movie. But what really cemented my desire was a lot of times when a studio knows that a movie is bad, they hold it back from reviewers. They won't let the journalists see the movie in advance. They'll, you know, the, the, for the terrible movies, they'll make them go to it, you know, on opening day if they want to do a review in their newspaper or blog or whatever. Right. But if a, a studio is really, really confident in their movie, they will hold press screenings like three weeks before the movie comes out. And they certainly did that with Into the Spider-Verse. Yeah, it was like almost a month before the movie was coming out they lifted the embargo on reviews because Sony was so pleased with the, f the final product of this movie. And we started seeing the reviews tumble in a few at a time, and they were all positive. Yeah, it wasn't until, I think, the day before the movie came out or so that there was a single negative review, and it took it from 100% down to 99 
but I'm pretty sure Yeah, did sure you know they now, did a commercial that uh, referenced that fact? No. Well, tell me about that. <laughs> they had a commercial where it says, Into the Spider-Verse, which has a 99 on Rotten Tomatoes. And then, I guess, uh, you know, they grabbed lines out of the film. And I don't remember when Gwen Stacy says this, but she says, like, uh, shouldn't it be 100? <laughs> And then somebody else says, like, oh, yeah, it's fine, or something like that. And then they showed that shot from the beginning where the uh, old Spider-Man is sitting in the bathtub crying while the shower sprays down on him. Because, you know, obviously it's not fine that he doesn't have a hundred anymore. It's too (laughs) sad. Oh, that's funny. But, you know, 99 is okay. It yeah. just, I, you're not going to please everybody. And it's possible that there is a reviewer out there that said, I'm going to be the sole voice of dissent because it will get my review a hundred times more clicks than another positive review would. That's possible. And, and, and we've talked about Rotten Tomatoes before of who decides what is a positive review and what is a negative review. And it's a lot of times... You judge whether this guy thought that the movie was good or not so good. I mean, if they don't say it was great, you're like, hmm, well, he, he mentioned these three things he didn't like, and he mentioned these four things that he did. Okay, more things he liked. I'm going to say it's a pause, you know, so I don't know. But it, we have reached the era where people will put the Rotten Tomatoes score or certified fresh on the front of the DVD or, you know, in the ad campaign which just shows, you know, how powerful that website has become. It has changed the way people view movies. I, I've heard there are lots of people that, you know, they check to see what it gets on Rotten Tomatoes before they go to it. And I remember being a kid and my mom and dad would read the review in the newspaper before they would decide whether to go to it or to take us to it or not. And so, you know, that sort of thing. There have always been people that do that. Yeah, I guess. Uh, (laughs) I find it kind of useful because I was always someone that just watched the commercials and then were like, oh, that looks funny. So I'd go and see it and I'd be like, oh, damn it. Why did I go and see Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey? It was the worst. It ruined my memories of the real Bill and Ted. And uh, now I've seen Station's butt, his most excellent butt. So it's nice to have something like Rotten Tomatoes that I can look at and go, oh, 97, huh? Do you know that Haley Steinfeld that's in Bumblebee is also the voice of Gwen Stacy? I did know that, but... It's kind of weird, huh? If it makes this episode better, no, I had no idea. I just, that's interesting. It's like, this happens fairly often with animated movies for some reason. They tend to open right at the same time as something else that's also got that person in it. Anyhow, what did you think of this film, other than that it had a high Rotten Tomatoes, which, by the way, it's down to 97. Oh, okay. Well, F it. Why? Why? Why Why are we even talking oh, about this? it saved me so much money. Yeah, why, why are we even talking about this? <laughs> you know, I was predisposed to like this movie, even without the buzz of it being positive. Uh, I love Spider-Man. And I've seen all the previous Spider-Mans, you know, in the theater with bells on. And uh, I Annoying managed... Annoying everybody uh, around you with the jingle of the bells. <laughs> and I managed to like every single previous Spider-Man film, uh, with one exception. You know, Spider-Man 3, people really, really dislike. And I found things to like in that. And so, uh, uh-huh. like I said, I, you know, I, I was expecting to like this movie maybe before i we even go into the movie i feel like there's an elephant in the room even though you know it's not controversial or anything like that but i i gotta ask you what did you think of the animation style of the movie because i was gonna say and i really liked into the spider verse even with that weird ass animation what do you mean by the weird ass animation do you mean like the 
there were 3D animation that kind of looked like it was 2D. But it didn't kind of look like it was 2D. It had like pixels and dots and it was supposed oh, okay. to look You're like newsprint stuff? and stuff. And and I kept noticing it and being like, what in... What? <sighs> So they don't want this to be an immersive experience. They want us to be reminded that we're reading a comic, we're watching a comic book adaptation. Is that what it is? Uh, well, they did a lot of that kind of stuff. Like, especially, uh, you, you really jumped out when you had, uh, when Miles gets his power and then all of a sudden you start seeing the boxes appear with his thoughts in them. I don't know. I, I, I think I'm much more uh, willing to go with things like that than you are. I liked it, <laughs> and uh, but I also liked the, when they did that stuff on the movie that was just called Hulk. Yes, it uh-huh. was just called Hulk. The Angley Hulk. The Angley Hulk movie where they had all of this stuff going on in little boxes all over. They had split screens in three and four t- ways. And they were showing you the action from various angles at once and stuff like that. And I remember thinking, wow, this is really cool. Um, I'm sure it'll go away soon, but it was neat. But it didn't go away. It stayed the entire movie, and I was kind of amazed. And I'm sure that's probably a reason why many people hated that movie. Although it's not the first reason why they hated it. But uh, I thought it was neat. And I liked the weird animation style and the... The comic bookiness of uh, this one as well, which puts us at odds. I just, <laughs> it, it makes me feel old. It's just an aspect where I was just like, Wait, that's, that's strange. And they, yeah, and like Ang Lee's Hulk, they kept doing it. You know, reminding us that it's a story or whatever is, is one thing. Like when they'd have the characters tell their origin and you'd see like the same images and you'd go like rewind the tape and stuff like that i thought was really cool but every once in a while the animation was just so strange that i it would it would take me out of the narrative and remind me that we're seeing something that i had frankly not seen before i just found found that unique but i i couldn't tell why they were doing it yeah i think it was just uh this is a comic book comes from a comic book, so we're going to go with the comic book thing. And yeah, I like that Ang Lee movie. I think that, you know, they were doing the same thing. And I liked the idea. And, you know, they still did it the whole way through, but I stopped really paying attention to it. You know, you notice it at first. You know, oh yeah, look at that. And then you just kind of stop noticing it and just get into the story. I don't know, maybe uh, that was a, a problem for you and you weren't able to stop noticing it and so you couldn't stay in the story. That suspension of disbelief thing that can be ruined by a movie when they do something silly. Like you bring a cartoon pig into it or something. <laughs> <laughs> I, You know, see, I saw it with an audience and, and people were really into it and, and enjoying it and you saw it alone and I wonder if that makes the experience different. You know, seeing something at home by yourself or seeing something with a crowd are two different things. And a lot of times with comedies, the laughter becomes infectious. You're around a lot of people that are are really having a good time and you start to have a good time. And I don't know if there's a very minor, like, psychic explanation for that. But that's 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 that that's what I've experienced. Yeah, I think it's a it, it is an infectious thing, especially with comedy. So I probably uh, didn't get the full experience that that you got because of the fact that nobody else showed up. I guess I should have sent out more invitations. Yeah, it was kind of like watching it in my front room with a much bigger screen. But what did you think of the origin story at the very start where he's like, yeah, let's go over this one last time. And he's like, I did this and this and they show all the scenes and it's animated versions of the movies that uh, Sony put out. So you see him on the front of the train doing his webs and stopping the train and you see him uh, 
kissing upside down in the rain and you see him doing that stupid dance thing where he's walking <laughs> along trying to be cool from <laughs> spider-man 3 he's like i even did this <laughs> but let's not talk it's about like, that. yeah i'm not proud of it either or whatever but that was the spider-man that we were seeing now i'm way less familiar with spider-man than you are well are you i mean you've seen all of the films and there's probably a movie that you've seen more than once. But I haven't read the comic books, which you've read tons of comic books. And this story is, you know, based on a comic book uh, idea, a comic book event or whatever. And Miles Morales, his origin is similar to this, right? Like the real Spider-Man dies and he has to take over for him, Right. Right. Yeah. Miles Morales came about after a, a story in which Peter Parker is killed and he and Miles is inspired by the sacrifice of Spider-Man and decides to take on the mantle himself after being bitten by a spider that I believe Norman Osborn had genetically engineered to try and replicate what happened to Peter. But you know, all of that stuff is, you know, ultimate universe a different universe than the stories that I read. Uh, right. And uh, the Spider-Verse crossover event was really, really recent where a bunch of parallel universe versions of Spider-Man came into our universe and Peter was able to interact with a Spider-Man from the 30s and a Spider-Man from the 80s, a punk Spider-Man and a Spider-Man from India and a Spider-Man from the future and a Spider-Man where Gwen Stacy had been bitten by the spider. And yeah, most famously, the, the Miles Morales from the Ultimate Universe coming to our universe. And I didn't read that. I Maybe I should have. I Maybe I should have done my, well, reading, <laughs> but I, I, I didn't. Yeah. Uh, and I, I was really interested when that story came about because of the Spider Gwen idea, the character, the idea of a Gwen Stacy who is bitten, and Peter helps her build the, the the webs and all that stuff, you know, to maintain her secret identity. I I, I always wanted to read those, and I did buy those, but I've never read them. Uh, I feel like I'm over explaining. <laughs> Well, we are here to talk. Oh, so. oh, well, thank goodness, because, yeah, what a coincidence, because, yeah, I, I do that quite a bit. Yeah, it's a good thing you came prepared. But, yeah, okay, to, to, to cut out all of the stuff I've just been saying, I had never read a book with Miles Morales in it before. I was not very familiar with him. He He's a fairly recent character invented during the... Obama administration because Barack Obama was a fan of Spider-Man and they took a little bit of inspiration with that. And, and, and if you look at the way that Miles was drawn when he was first created, he was sort of influenced by Barack Obama, but also by Donald Glover, who had made it known that he wanted to be Spider-Man and who, who, who had, in an episode of Community, wore a Spider-Man, wore Spider-Man pajamas <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, anyhow, uh, just... everybody was calling for him to play Spider-Man at I guess when they were rebooting him again. Yeah, well, the first time when when it looked like they were going to be doing any more Tobey Maguire movies and they said we're well, we're going to redo Spider-Man, people were saying, "Well, hey, let's let Donald audition. That's something that he really wants to do and it's time." So I think they took a little bit of uh the media attention from that and the media attention of a president of the United States name-checking Spider-Man and created this character. And, and, you know, there were naysayers at the time. People that said that it was a stunt or that it was, you know, fill in the blank of however you want to be negative about it. But years on, you know, six, seven, eight years on, Miles has sort of stuck around, and I think a lot of people have warmed to the character, and uh, I certainly warmed to the character seeing him in this movie. Right, yeah, he was a good character in the movie. Did Miles Morales 
always have I, I, maybe I shouldn't be asking you this because you've just admitted that you don't know all that much but uh, d- did he always have this invisibility power and this uh, shocking power on top of all the Spider-Man stuff? You, yeah, you can predict that I'm going to say I don't know. <laughs> okay. But he does have it in the comics, those two abilities that uh, are beyond what Peter Parker has. And I think that they've explained that his strength and spider sense are, are weaker than Peter's, but yeah, there was an action figure of Miles Morales, and it came with a lightning attachment, and I remember seeing that and thinking, what? Because it was the same (laughs) lightning attachment that came with Storm Uh and came with Thor, (laughs) and I was just like, but okay, Storm can make lightning, and Thor can make lightning. What is this? (laughs) But now I know. Yep, apparently so. Yeah, I was uh, confused with that when that first came up. I'm like, what the hell? Why is he turning invisible? Did he also (laughs) get cosmic rays and become one of the Fantastic Four while he was at it? Um, You know, I feel like for the vast majority of viewers, of adult viewers, this would be the premiere of Miles Morales. This would be their introduction to Miles Morales. Uh, We've seen Miles in cartoons, you know, or like my nephews have. (laughs) But you and I probably wouldn't have seen those cartoons right i don't think i've seen a miles morales one i've seen some of those cartoons uh because my kids watched them and i would be you know in the vicinity of the television while they were playing um i've seen some of the ultimate spider-man cartoons uh, in which spider-man has become deadpool and talks to the audience all the time but 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 isn't that ultimate spider-man in title only yeah, yeah, it's not ultimate, ultimate. Well, there are some things. Like, for example, at the start of this film, we had a Spider-Man fighting the Green Goblin. Okay. But the Green Goblin was the Green Goblin in name only. He was fighting Fin Fang Foom or something. <laughs> it was this gigantic Fin Fang Foom Hulk. It was huge, like super strong looking. And it had dragon wings to go along with its goblin face and the the face was barely gobliny but uh, that was the only way you would recognize that this is supposed to be the same character and i think they call him like monster goblin or something like that but i've seen that was in the ultimate spider-man cartoon and i gather that that must be from the ultimate uh universe yeah, I, I believe that Norman Osborn takes some kind of elixir to turn into a Hulk-like monster in the Ultimate stories. But I, I again, I, I'm not familiar with any of those. Is that that's not that sort of thing is not my bag, baby. <laughs> <laughs> they they just keep striking out as far as making a Green Goblin that looks like the comic Green Goblin. And at this point, I guess I am more forgiving (laughs) that it looked like Chernabog from uh, Fantasia (laughs) because it's just like, well, okay, I guess that's that's neat. In animation, you can do anything you want. But yeah, it was was some kind of monster that he fought. Spider-Man certainly looked like Spider-Man. Yes, he did. And I really dug that, how good he looked and how well they got the mask right and... uh, the web sp- swinging and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, those sorts of things, they lend themselves to animation in such a wonderful way, in a way that I guess is very difficult to do in live action. Because, you know, eventually you do have to replace the actor with a CG version to get it to do the things that Spider Man can do. But, you know, for example, Iceman is another character that's like that. that works so great on the page and in animation, but when they do a CG version of a human being as Iceman, it never looks right. It always looks like an unfinished animated character or something. (laughs) Right. You know who else is really good like that that same way is uh, Firestar. You know, they they just can't do... uh, (laughs) 
Yes. I mean, we could, the, here's another outtake for the, the end of the episode. <laughs> How many times have they tried to do Firestar in life action and it never, ever works? Okay, the, <laughs> let's talk about the Taylor Swift 2014 Firestar. I, there were times when it's I couldn't even... Spider-Man and his amazing friends. Okay, back. Uh, outtake over? Sure. Um, but yeah, they, they did a Dr. Octopus in this movie, and the, the tentacles could oh, right. do... I wanted to ask you what you thought of that. <sighs> well, I don't know if we even want to go into this. I, I feel she was there so that you could have another major female character. And, and, and she was certainly gross, and she was certainly evil. And so I thought that that was cool, but it just, and yes, the tentacles looked really rad. That's what I was tr trying to get at. In animation, those tentacles can do anything because they're alive. They're a part of her. But in a live action film, it would be so much more challenging to do, uh, you know, the tentacles. And when they did them in Spider-Man 2, you know, the, a lot of the times they were really there and they were sort of puppet things, you know, with, or marionette type things. And I, I can't even imagine how difficult that was to pull off in a realistic way. But uh, yeah, I just, I, uh, I guess we can talk about the diverse elements in this film. Because, you know, with Miles, you get a, a black teenager or a half black, half Hispanic teenager and, and you get the girl version of Spider-Man and Prowler turned out to be black and, and, and Tombstone has always been black, although you wouldn't know it from his skin color. Uh, you get a Hispanic scorpion. I feel like I'm missing at least one more. Oh, you get the Japanese girl. Uh, what? Is, oh gosh, she's got an interesting name. Is it Penny Parker? Yeah, it is Penny Parker. And uh, I still feel like there's one more that I'm not remembering in addition to the female Doc Ock. You know, it's just sort of a United Colors of Benetton movie where let's get as, as diverse a cast as we can so that everybody has representation in the movie. And it may sound like I'm being super critical when I'm saying this, but I, I feel like this movie, it worked. You know, there weren't moments where I was just like, wait, wait a second. Maybe, maybe female Doc Ock was the closest where I was just like, oh, okay. So she's Olivia Octavius or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. See, for me, and I don't know if this is why they did it, but I thought that it basically was kind of like a red herring. You know what I mean? Because when you first... Uh, run into Olivia Octavius. She's in the uh, talking about quantum theory or whatever on his little film in his class, and then he, uh, you see her talking to Kingpin, and she just seems like a you know general crazy scientist. And since she's not a squat fat dude with big glasses or whatever, you don't think, oh, that's Otto Octavius. <laughs> so it's basically the red herring. Like this is not someone that you need to worry about. So that when you find out that she is actually Dr. Octopus, it's a surprise. Um, even for someone like you or me who knows about uh, Dr. Octopus as opposed to others who might, you know, be less familiar with comics lore and uh, although i was gonna ask you and i suppose again you're the wrong guy to ask because you don't like the ultimates but <laughs> is dr octopus a female in the ultimate universe well the, the My guess is no the, the short answer is i don't know okay that's what i thought but the long answer is i just clicked on it just to see and no, Ultimate Marvel is uh, a man as well. Okay, so this is just a thing for this. So no one could have been prepared unless they bathed in spoilers uh, for that reveal. So I, I don't know. I, I found that to work. Although I have to tell you that I didn't. You dug the, the look of the 
tentacles or whatever for Doctor Octopus because they were like I like green. I, I liked the way that they moved and stuff because it was just like, geez, you know, they were alive. They were tentacles rather than yeah. what Doc Ock has always had in my mind, which is are mechanical appendages. You know, it's like uh, uh, I I don't want to say like Wolverine's claws, but something like that. They're like cables. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. I've never felt like these were the actual octopus tentacles before and with Olivia Octavius. Yeah. I just, I wouldn't have been surprised if they had revealed that they were actually a part of her and she was an alien that had tentacles, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's the way I felt. They kind of felt like gross things, which I guess, you know, that's just me being, <sighs> too stuck in what I know to uh, to be open to interpretations, which is a dumb way to go into a movie like Into the Spider-Verse where obviously you're going to be getting different interpretations of the story that you know, because that's the whole point. The whole movie is about other universes and their Spider-Man coming out. So, of course, we're going to see other unusual stuff. Anyways, I don't know. You know, it's funny how that happens. You know, you go to a movie that's based on something that is already a known quantity. And there's going to be things that you see and go, eh, that wasn't as good as whatever, the comic book or the the, the movie from 2004 or whatever. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess it is what it is. Everybody's going to go and see a Star Wars movie and expect Star Wars to be like the Star Wars that they like. And then it's going to be different. And you're going to be like, oh, that wasn't the Star Wars that I like, so I don't like it. I have to admit, I'm still that way. I, uh, I have a hard time with various things. And yeah, I guess the octopus squid arms, whatever, the, the living looking arms, the ones that look like they were made of slime. They did. Yeah, they, I don't know why, but they bugged me, I have to admit. Oh, okay. Well, th that's cool. I guess I was just uh, trying to ex make comparisons of, of things that work in animation that don't work as well in live action. But I feel like we've left that part of the discussion far, far, far behind us. Okay. But going back to, <laughs> yes, I've loved Spider-Man my whole life, and I felt like this depiction of Peter Parker was great. Uh-huh. He was ne'er do well, which is the Peter that I love, and and they showed him, and you know, and and again, if somebody feels that this character is sacred to them, I could see the overweight, schlubby Peter Parker as as offensive to somebody that you know is like it is sacred. This is character assassination, Peter Parker, <laughs> but. To me, his heart was in the right place, and this was a Spider-Man who life had just beaten down so, so, so much. And nobody's been beaten down in comic books as much as Spider-Man. But that's what makes him Spider-Man, is that he just keeps getting back up. And life always craps on Spider-Man, and yet he's he still tries to do the right thing, and tries to remember his uncle's words and tries to be a hero and that's one of the th reasons that i love him and that he is sacred to me that th that he means so much to me and i feel like this depiction of him got that aspect of the character just right, right. and got the look of the character just right and that at the end because miles just couldn't hack it as a spider-man Peter was willing to stay behind and lose his world or die. No, at this point, I think they had said, you won't survive outside of your universe. Yep. He was willing to die to help the others get back. And it's like, that is Spider-Man. That is who Spider-Man is. And so, yeah, despite any cosmetic differences, this was the character that I recognized and and I really really responded to that part of it, uh, but he you know he wasn't the main character of the movie that was Miles, and in many ways this was my introduction to Miles as well, 
And I just loved that character. I thought that he was very likable and relatable and well-rounded and he had depth to him. And I will be happy to continue to see stories about this character. Despite whether his creation was to check a couple of boxes or a publicity stunt, regardless of his actual real-life origin, this character spoke to me, and I dug it. Yeah, it's interesting uh, how that sometimes happens. I watched a YouTube video where they talked about spin-off characters. For example... Spider, like all of these characters that you see in this movie are spin-off characters. Spider-Man Noir and Spider-Ham and Spider... Sp- Spider... What is the robot called? It's like SP slash slash DR or something. Yeah, I, my cousin and I call that character Spider after uh, the <laughs> Megamind trailer, but I, I, I don't know that it is pronounceable. But yeah, those ones are spin-off characters. Or you have Bat Girl and Bat... A uh, woman, uh, she, Hulk, uh, Supergirl, Supergirl, Superboy, Super Dog, Super Horse, Super Cats. <laughs> what about Beppo the Super Monkey? Does he count? Yes, Beppo the Super Monkey. Oh, okay. There's, uh, yeah, Batman, Bat Woman, Man Bat, Bat Rock the Leaper. Anyways, yeah, all of those kind of characters are the spin-off characters. And yeah, basically most times that a character like this comes into existence, it is with less than uh, awesome motivations. You know, like She-Hulk, for example. The time that they came up with She-Hulk, they had the Hulk. And the Hulk was a TV show. And the reason they created She-Hulk is because they were afraid that the people in the that were making the TV show The Hulk would just make a She-Hulk. And then they would own the rights because they created this character. And so it would be theirs to do with as they will. And so they said, oh my gosh, we need to make a She-Hulk before they do because we need to have the rights as our own. You know, that's basically the entire reason why they made that. And yet they put enough effort into it and they they put enough heart into it that the She-Hulk became an interesting character people like her and she's you know a a worthy addition to the marvel universe and has stuck around for what 40 years i don't know how long it's been since the 70s yeah i would say 40 years she hulk might have been 1980 but let's say 40 just for fun okay it's close enough so yeah i mean that's often what happens but all that really matters is if you put enough into it and i suppose there's probably a bunch of spin-off characters that are out there that have just kind of gone away <laughs> you know cuz nobody cared about them you know they didn't put enough into them to make them interesting and they just said well that was an experiment that didn't work and they stopped using that character i guess that's the difference you know miles morales is the spin-off that you know, they put enough into it that people are interested in him and that they want to hear more about his story. They make a movie of him and so forth. Okay, well, what what were your thoughts on Miles before you saw the movie and then now? Uh, I was pretty unaware of Miles really before the movie. I mean, I'd heard of him. I knew that there was a Spider-Man out there, uh, a Miles Morales Spider-Man but yeah, I, I I really didn't know much about him. Uh, so I guess my thoughts about him were meh, I don't know, yeah, whatever. <laughs> but yeah, since watching the movie, I really I really enjoyed it. Uh, I thought he was a really interesting character, and he was uh, he was fun. And I'd go watch Spider Verse two, <laughs> second verse, same as the first, a little bit louder and a little bit worse. I'd watch it. I I was going to say that uh, when this movie came to an end, I don't know how much they spent on this thing. Do you have any idea what the budget for it was? Uh, A short answer, I don't know. Long answer, (laughs) I've got it right here. Yeah? 90 million they spent on it. Uh, What was the... I'm I'm assuming you've also got this right there. How much did it make this uh, opening weekend? At the time of this recording, uh, it's made 56. Okay. 
So it's definitely going to make its budget back. I don't know. I was just thinking, I don't know how expensive uh animated film like this is. But gosh, they should make more of them. I mean, there's so many comic book stories that you could tell. And they don't always have to be live action. And they don't always have, you know, we can have different versions of these things out there. I guess they made this as though it goes along with the Sony uh, Spider-Man, you know, series. As though it's just like further down the the spiral. You know, they, they don't have to be connected. They don't have to be, oh, this is the sequel to this or this is the sequel to that. It can just be this is into the Spider-Verse story or, you know, this is X-Men Days of Future Past or this is X-Men God Loves Man Kills or, you know, just pick a a storyline. There's dozens upon dozens. They do that with the DC animated movies all the time. Yeah, exactly. Why don't they do that with Marvel? Why does Marvel just cede it all to DC and say, yeah, you can have that. We're just going to, we're not going to try Do you think the success of this film might make Marvel Studios consider getting into animation? Uh, I don't know. I I think they could have done it if they wanted to by now. The DC movies that they make, most of those go straight direct to video. Uh, Something like this is a big difference from those. Right, but DC is owned by Warner Brothers, which has its own animation studio, and Sony has its own animation studio. So maybe that's part of why we've never seen Marvel Studios do that, is this, like they would have to farm out the work to somebody else. And But yeah, I, I don't have an answer, man. I, I, I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, I just thought it would be interesting. They ought to go there, because they got so much stuff that they can work with. I mean, obviously, they've been publishing comic books for decades upon decades and uh yeah i mean they could make a cloak and dagger or great lakes avengers or <laughs> whatever yeah, that's you know a, fantastic four why not okay yeah there you go you can make a fantastic four that doesn't suck and put it in theaters you know that could be your way to get fantastic four into the marvel universe is introduce them in an animated film and then now everybody knows who they are. Pop up. That might not be a good idea. I don't know. Anyways. Yeah, I imagine we'll see that fairly soon and we'll, we'll find out what they do with it. But uh, all I know is that Sony uh, intends to make sequels and spinoffs to this. Uh, as you do whenever anything is successful or liked. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm totally willing to follow them and see where it, it goes. I don't know. The fact that the, and, and you know, pardon me for using this word, but the real Spider-Man was in this also made it really easy for me to go into it, to check it out. And if you do a sequel where Peter Parker is not part of it, I don't know if there's any risk of that not being as successful. But they've hooked me with this. You know what I mean? If they decided to make a sequel two years from now and it's just Miles and Gwen and, you know, they've got some kind of romance thing going on, I'll be happy to check that out. But I don't know if I am representative of everybody. If there were people that, you know, were less than impressed with Miles and and, and dug it for, you know, the Peter Parker aspect. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know that... Especially after this, I think once you've introduced the character, you can go. You know what I mean? You know, you've got the the groundwork and you can go with a Miles Morales version. And you, I to tell you the truth, you could probably do the uh, other version too. Like how fat Spider-Man becomes uh, in shape and gets his life back together. How Spider-Man got his groove back. <laughs> yeah, there you go. He needs to get his mojo back. Baby. Yeah. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> no, no, we we're just talking about uh, sequels and how that could work or not work. So, the, I, I I heartily recommend this movie. It was um, it was really fun and moving. I I, I I found myself moved several times during it. So you're saying this was a moving picture? Yes, for the 
octogenarians in the audience <laughs> that might get that joke. That's that's exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> in this day and age, you can get some crass aspects to movies. And then, yeah, there there is the special interest aspect of movie making now that, that it seems like we deal with a lot. And it, it probably wouldn't have taken a lot for me to be pushed away by this. But I, I feel like they humanized all of these characters. You didn't get a token fill-in-the-blank that did everything perfect because they didn't want to offend that segment of the audience. Do you know what I'm saying? And I, I hope I'm not being offensive when I say this, but a lot of times when you get some kind of ethnicity or religion or something that is depicted in a movie, they're afraid. They don't want to alienate this portion of the audience. And so this character is flawless. This character is there as like the perfect representation of blank. And a lot of times it's just like, well, why was that even there then? That's not interesting. What the crap? That wasn't even a character. That was a a cipher or something that was that was a political statement being made having that character uh -huh. in there you know what i'm saying and i didn't feel mm -hmm. that throughout this movie with the characters you know what i mean it's just like prowler was miles's uncle and he was multifaceted and he was good and bad and uh, you know that's what people are despite their skin color or the shape of their eyes or the God they believe in or who they sleep with. You know what I'm saying? It's like people mm -hmm. are people. So why should it be? No. <laughs> Anyhow, I just, I, I liked that aspect of the movie. I feel like they got that. They nailed that. And especially in the Miles persona, in, in that character, it's just like they made me a fan of Miles Morales, you know, the very end of 2018. Yeah, that's definitely the case. They they made all the characters have depth. They were ra well rounded. There was something to them. They had struggles that they had to uh, overcome, which makes it a much more interesting uh, movie. That's uh, something I think that sometimes people forget when they're trying to uh, help diversify things. Well, uh, right, right. I mean, you complain all the time, and, and maybe I shouldn't signal you out. People complain <laughs> all the time that Rey in the Star Wars sequels is a perfect character, that she sprung fully formed from the, the, the side of Zeus. Where is the weakness and where is the frailty and where is the humanity in that character? And Spider-Gwen could easily have been the worst representation of that mentality where it's like, well, it's a girl, Spider-Man, so she has to be smarter and faster and better than the man. But I liked the character of, of the, the female Spider-Man. I, I, I think, did they call her Spider-Woman in this or what did they call her? Yeah, she did call herself Spider-Woman. They didn't call her Ghost Spider, They didn't Ghost call her Spider-Gwen. Spider right? And they didn't call her Spider-Gwen, okay. Yeah, it would have been so easy to have her just be faster and snarkier and eye-rollingly irritating and not a character at all, but some kind of statement so that somebody in the audience could go, yeah! And that's not interesting. That's not something you can put your heart into, is a yeah character. That's a political statement. And so, the, 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 you know, this Spider-Gwen was unable to get close to people because she had lost people, I'm assuming, because of mistakes that she had made or not being good enough and all that. And again, you care about somebody that has a way to go, that has to grow and change and learn, that's not already there. And so, yeah, once again, kudos that they pulled that off. Yeah, I think this movie deserves its high rating on the tomatometer. Or is it tomato meter? It's got to be tomatometer, what, right? I'll tell you what. Whichever you say it is, that's wh how I will say it from now on. Because, all right, you're cool. We're gonna call it the tomatometer. <laughs> all right, I'm not cool anymore. Um, 
<laughs> All right, I think we've uh, probably said our piece and we're winding down here. So let's just uh, let, let's end it before it devolves into something not worth listening to anymore, if it ever well, was. I, I hope I wasn't too political there. No, I think you did fine. But I just felt like maybe we could touch on that when it works. But when it doesn't work, I'm worried about touching on it. <laughs> right. Because of the people that don't look at the context in which you say something. I guess we've had this conversation on the air before. Probably. Uh, and maybe we don't need to have it again. But it's just, uh, yeah, when it's done well, I want to laud it. I want to point a light on it and say, hey, this is how it's done, people. It didn't matter blank. This was a person first and foremost. Yep. That's, I think, the most important thing because people are people. <laughs> so uh, thanks for listening, everybody. <laughs> And uh, have a good uh, a good time until we come back. I was going to say a good week, but that's way optimistic. <laughs> Too optimistic. Yes, make no promises there, sir. But thank you for, to the people that listened all the way through the episode. And uh, hopefully you will be back the next time we get together. We'll see you again soon, folks. See ya. Bye-bye. Goodbye, spider friends. That gets my goat, or whatever this is ultimately called, is produced under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivative license. Very sad. <laughs> they had a commercial where it says, Into the Spider-Verse, which has a 99 on Rotten Tomatoes. Here's an outtake for you. I saw a commercial like that for fucking Bumblebee. And it said 97 on Rotten Tomatoes. And if I had been drinking anything, we would have got a great spit take. <laughs> because I, I cannot imagine a Transformers movie ever getting even a 60, let alone high 90s. Yeah, I've told the guys at work that I just I refuse to uh, see any of those Transformers movies. And yeah, there was a commercial on today where it said, it's the best transformers movie yet and he's like see that you're gonna take uh, your kids to go see that movie and i said best transformers movie yet that's like saying it's the best piece of shit yet it's still a piece of shit <laughs> doesn't matter that it's the best one i mean yeah oh, it's the most you know even color of brown has the least chunks of nuts undigested in it oh geez you're a little harsher on it than i am bumblebee has a 96 I just figured that people were, were being soft on it because it was better than the others. You know, they, they weren't comparing it to a real movie. They're comparing right. it to the other Transformers movies. And of yeah, course exactly. you're going to give it thumbs up if you're comparing it to the other Transformers movies, which are, as you said, giant hunks of human waste. That's exactly what I'm talking about. But I don't know that i just thought it would be nice to have an outtake in this episode <laughs> all right so we get back to it yes i press the button you're listening to the dune steve audio fiction magazine